हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज अनुराधा शर्मा एंड यू आर वाचिंग माय चैनल आइल्स विद अनुराधा नाउ वी शुड बिगिन यू शुड आंसर द क्वेश्चंस एज यू लिसन बिकॉज़ यू विल नॉट हियर द रिकॉर्डिंग अ सेकंड टाइम लिसन केयरफुली एंड आंसर क्वेश्चंस 1 एंड 2 Hi Joanna, where have you been? Hi Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full program of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see: an Italian film, a rock concert, and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh look it's 0967 Okay I'll write it down 0967 0970 Thanks I thought the local council made a profit from the festival but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor it's a local bank I didn't know that Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the city hall. Uh. That's only three pound sixty-five for students. Hmm. I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only two pounds fifty for students. Sounds good. Is that in the city hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the sports centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no, they've not been asked. Apparently, oh, no, it's a poetry evening. Hmm, isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday, that's at the college. It's quite expensive though, fifteen pounds for adults and twelve pounds seventy-five for students. Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. 
But on Saturday night, there isn't live music or a party or anything. Just the fireworks in the city park. And that's only £1.50. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 18. Today I have with me Moira McKenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right. And it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland. Including the 790 islands that lie scattered around the coast, it covers 39,000 square kilometres. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the 280 kilometres from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82, which runs up to Fort William and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact the region has a generally mild climate as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of 1 degree centigrade in January up to 18 in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though, the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground. You can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as 2,000 millimetres regularly falls, though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay, in Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just £25, or for £28 to £30 in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the 23rd of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20.
As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, it's best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. Wild animals and pets don't mix, so please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two undergraduates doing a research methods course. A girl called Leela and a boy called Jake having a seminar with their tutor. Now you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourselves. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well... The article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. 
There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam, whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. And, of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project... I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers, fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. 100 years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer, they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard-packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six-meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian, some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns in housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.